about the Penn State partners. And why don't we go around and do introductions? I think there's just a lot of new faces. And um, I'm going to ask Matt to please make a note that we bring table tents next time so that we have people write their names on table tents. Just coming back from Zoom to real, real engagement, it scratches those old memories like, oh, yes. People's names are not hanging under their chins anymore. So we'll do that next time so you can see. Um, and then we won't need to do introductions every time. So let's just do your name. And if you are associated with an organization, share. If not, um, just share your passion. Of course, of course I do. Uh, my name is Emily Lehman, and I hail from Unite Us. And I'm out of the class. I'm Candy Koenig. I'm with the Monroe Meyer Institute here in Kearney at Children's Solutions. My name is Penny Parker. I am with uh, Medicaid, Nebraska Total Care, and I'm also on the board for the Arc of Buffalo County. And I'm Linda Fedorchik with Buffalo County Community I'm Hope Schwartz. I'm the communications coordinator at the State Tennis. And I'm Martha Martinez with Buffalo County Community Partners. And I'm Doug Kramer I'm with the Buffalo County Attorney's Office for Health Services Unit. Libby uh, Harsh, Brennan Public Schools, Dixon, South Partnership. Aaron Small, Ditto. <laughs> Andy Shoham, um, DFU 10. I'm Janelle Kravowski, I'm from Urbana, I'm a retired teacher and I'm on the Buffalo County Board. I'm Trina Pines, I'm the Health, Nutrition, and Mental Health Service Coordinator for the Community Action Partnership with Nebraska Head Start. I'm Cassie Kazuki, I work at Nebraska VR, and I'm a business account manager, so I need these businesses and hiring individuals who have disabilities. I'm Kathy Gifford, I'm with Buffalo County Community Partners, retired teacher. David Schroeder, I'm with Buffalo County Community Partners. I'm Amber Cochran, and I'm with Top Mills USA. I'm Jill Grace, and I'm with the Friends Program. I'm Ellery Butterfield, and I'm with Buffalo County Community Partners as well. Alexandra Dillon, with Early Learning Connection, out of ESU 10. Marisa Lanovar, Early Learning Connection Specialist, Bilingual, out of ESU 10. Mandy Puente um, from Cordia, based out of Hastings, um, providing education and job training services to farm workers out of the Tri City area. Haley Yellowneck, two members of the Public Health Department. Amber Springer, CDC Foundation. Matt Morse, Buffalo County Community Partners. Nicole Hirsch, I am a CFS supervisor with Health and Human Services, and I'm also a board member, and I'm also a co leader for our youth, adolescent, and children's program. Well, welcome everybody. We are at the Youth, Adolescent, Adolescents and Children's Award Group of the new collaborative. So we're an arm of the full collaborative. We are the first pilot that's getting started with collaborative work around youth, children, and adolescents. So we're, as a Buffalo County Community Partners Board, we're learning um, and staff, we're learning a little bit about how to um, do this collective impact work. I do believe there's a few people that maybe you have not had a chance to get introduced if you wanted to just share your name and who you represent or your passion. Hi, I'm Janelle Brown. I'm with the current area children's Museum. Welcome. Jason Sharp, I um, work with high school youth here in New York. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. All right, welcome. So our main purpose today is to refresh our collective knowledge from the last meeting. We also are going to finalize this priority list that you guys rocked it last time. I'm just going to say I have talked so much about your last meeting to donors and to other volunteers and to the board. You did some fantastic work last time. So we're going to um, refresh our minds on that and talk about those next steps. And then we're going to resume action planning. We're going to be a little bit more centered around results with our action planning today. And then we're going to discuss how um, this information would be presented back to the steering committee. And do I have steering committee members present? You want to throw your hands up so people kind of know steering committee is the overall guidance of the collaborative. So they're learning how um, this is working and how um, they can model this for other work groups, as well as how they can support the work that you guys are doing as well. 
and the community partner board. So community partner board members, I know you introduce yourselves, but maybe throw your hands up and show people board members that are also just here to support and understand how they can bring the information of the work that you're doing back to the board. So there is minutes attached. If um, anyone would like to make a motion to approve those minutes, I would accept. I'll make a motion. Thank you, Haley. Is there a second? All right, thank you, Ellery. Um, all those in favor? Anyone opposed? All right, minutes from last meeting is approved. Last time we did just a little refresher of what is collective impact and results based accountability. So I would um, just open the floor again for just a quick brief of anybody who would want to just talk a little bit about what collective impact is or what we're what we're all doing here together. Does anyone want to give it a give it a stab? This is how we practice the language. So you may want to test test it. See how it sounds coming from your voice. There is no wrong answer. I will tell you that. Working together for the same goal. Thank you, Erin. Anybody want to build on that? Understanding how our uh, various different um, work groups and whatnot uh, impact collectively the community. Other thoughts? Some of you have heard this over and over and over again, so that's why it's always at the top of our agenda. <laughs> Is anybody new to this model that you see up here? It's okay if you're new. Awesome, fantastic. I learned what we always making decisions based on data and how things were made better by what we did. So finding that shared agenda amongst all of us that are here today, today which you are making great headway, you have a, prior, a prioritized list of what that shared agenda could possibly be, and then shared measurements along with that is that collective impact. Results accountability. Fantastic. Um, there is a phases document, I do believe it's also attached. And I believe we are, have, I think we've left the sharing phase. I think we're pretty smack dab in the alignment phase. Would you guys all agree that's where we're at in our phases? I would say the last meeting we were kind of had a foot in both sharing and alignment. I mean, we can still do the sharing piece, but I think you're a little bit more firmer in the alignment phase. Is that why you come to me? I hope so. <laughs> All right, enough for me. I think I'm handing off to your actual leaders. I'm just a substitute today. So Alexandra, off to you. Thank you. Thanks for coming today. I appreciated all the great work we did at the last meeting. So we're going to roll up our sleeves and, and keep going today. This is just a quick recap to help us all get our head around where we were and what we need to do today. So last month, we agreed to use the collective impact model to guide how we action plan. And we agreed to use the result-based accountability model to evaluate the impact of our actions. And that accountability model has three questions we'll always need to be asking ourselves to evaluate our work. How much we do, how well we do it, and is anyone better off because of it? Um, the group was presented with five shared connections based on the work that was done in July. And those five connections that, that were um, shared included parent education and family involvement, workforce, mental health slash difficult behaviors, accessibility, and technology. And if you remember, we voted, we did a prioritization among this group, and then we also wanted to make sure that those who couldn't attend had an opportunity to weigh in, and we did um, calculate their levels of interest, and the first priority accounting for both groups is parent education and family involvement. So that is my recap. Anything she missed that right. you want to emphasize as a group? I know. What questions do you have from the last? You had more time to think about those connections. I mean, the the prioritization fell out: parent education, family involvement. Second was mental health. Third, workforce. Four, accessibility, and five, technology. And I think we'll probably.
probably find ourselves dipping into those as we as we get through parent education and family engagement as well. All right. So next on our agenda is really kind of looking at that top priority and kind of coming up with some action type steps. Last time we came up with just two quick, I guess, action steps that we thought maybe were achievable or doable. Um, but we kind of want to get into that a little deeper today. Um, and we talked about maybe breaking out. I guess we kind of want to know from you guys if we want to just talk about it as a big group, which last time I thought that worked really well because there was lots of conversation going on, or if we want to break out into like smaller groups. Um, what's everybody saying? Do we want to take a vote maybe? <coughs> Who wants to break out into smaller groups? Anybody? <laughs> Let's go with big group. <laughs> okay. Um, so do we have this document yet? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, I think it was in the packet. Oh, I'm sorry, not, I did not pass that one around. I just passed this around to everybody. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Um, so that's the priority that we everybody voted on as our top priority. And that's really looking at parents and providers partnering to provide education. <laughs> Is that and also deciding um, what the focused education will be. So we talked a lot about executive functioning, self-control, things like that. Um, so Denise said she handed around like the matrix. Um, so the first thing we probably want to talk about is how much we do. And that's really like who are our customers and um, who else we have out there that provide these type of services that would have an impact here. Um, Alex also put together a nice little sheet and we don't have copies for everybody, um, but she did a nice job of kind of giving us maybe a baseline, I guess, um, to kind of help the conversation along a little bit. Um, if you guys remember the um, email or the invitation that you sent out, there were two attachments. One was the agenda packet, and the second was an Excel spreadsheet that had data. So question, if we look at question, I think it's two, who's doing work in this area that should be included in the next meeting? Um, and there was another question, who's leading work in this area or achieving the greatest impact and could be considered by the collaborator to lead the implementation of action steps? So maybe just to get us going in terms of, um, before we jump into, who's doing what I, i'd be really curious what do you guys who do you think of as the customer for when we talk about partnering with families and parents when we think about our evaluation questions who specifically do we want to try and make their life better the children and the parents and if you think of children and parents are there specific groups of children or parents Children and parents. Yeah, we're going to make it get really specific. Anyway, mm -hmm. early, the early years, because this is one of the fundamental development happens in children. And so understanding that and how we're going to affect them as they're growing. So they'd be like, you were three, you were zero to five years, and so they kind of have brain function. So our children are supposed to have a much trauma or really been just
to include that into our conversation next year. Instead of just starting at birth, let's start at yeah, prenatal. Yeah. I really like that um, because at a at any time you go into a doctor visit, physically you're fine, but the emotional well-being being of a mother, I think is very crucial that we're missing that point and we're not. I don't, I, I don't see any, any um, intervention um, being put in place if they're not well. So when we talk, talk about early years, I feel like we're missing prenatal where we can send that support to the parent, you know, if the parent is well, the child is well as well. Great. So I'm hearing that when we think about our target audience, we're talking about parents particularly with a particular emphasis on parents of children from birth to three and parents who are um, pregnant. In our criminal justice, company, when I started 30 years ago, we used the term at risk with our youth. I've learned that nowadays, I think every youth is at risk, you know, especially if they don't have the same two parent household, one parent, you know, so many different risk factors, but I think all of the youth that I work with through the county attorney's office are at risk for one thing or another, whether it's neglect, abuse, not having somebody there, but that one person to pick up on how they're doing or not doing. And so the youth that we work with are uh, ages 11 to 20, uh, occasionally with different service providers, their younger siblings, so I think even younger are touched and affected. But nowadays, especially with the health partners, there's a big emphasis on prevention. It used to be more reactive. You know, they come to us because they've gotten into trouble. But now I think the services are kind of even before that, prior to them having any contact with law enforcement. Parenting by the police is not a good, good option anymore. Anymore. <laughs> and believe me, if you talk to enough police officers, they don't get paid enough to do the parenting part as well as the law enforcement part. I, I appreciate that perspective because, I, especially, I think with COVID, everybody, I mean, we've all been through some level of, of trauma and, and difficult experiences. And so, to your point, to think of it as all and preventative is, I think, a great perspective. Um, I'd like to kind of piggyback off of what Doug said and just um, while we're thinking about families that we think about the fact that there are a lot of teenagers um, or even a lot of adults that are filling in a lot of those parent roles and whatnot. And so when we think of parents, we should think of parent figures maybe as well. I just kind of wanted to check in with our folks on Zoom. We don't always let them with the introductions, but I wanted to see if they had anything additional to add. Any thoughts? Michelle, do you want to um, facilitate an introduction of people that are on Zoom? I can if you want me to. Um, we do have a few Zoom participants. Uh, let's introduce ourselves. I'll call out some names here. So Leslie, uh, Nate, and Andrea. Leslie Martin, I'm with Community for Kids, um, the coordinator. Nate Dennis with Kearney Police Department. Andrea, you're still muted. You're trying to chat to us. Andrea Raby with Buffalo County Community Partners and nurse practitioner at CHI Kearney Clinic. Samantha, Janelle, Natalie. Uh, Samantha Keim is with DHHS. She might be out from her computer. We also have Natalie Hanna, early childhood educator, uh, presently caring for children. Thanks for being with us, Natalie. Uh, Janelle, would you like to introduce yourself? 
Yeah, Janelle Brock. I'm a clinical social worker with the VA in Grand Island, covering the western part of the state with the suicide prevention program. Thank you. And then Michelle Tukon, Marketing Director, Community Partners. We have Alex uh, Reason, who's our Executive Assistant, and then uh, Tiana Miller, our Behavioral Health Coordinator, also on Zoom. Thank you. And Michelle, is there anything um, from those of you on Zoom that you want to add to this conversation as Alexander is asking the question to help define um, the parents who will be the target of our, um, our customers, I can say not our target, our customers for our work. And what I've been hearing is prenatal to some point in time. Um, I don't know if we've really discussed what that, that next age group is. Uh, parents who are <coughs> serving a part of um, children's lives and they may note, note that they could be a teenager or other person that we would typically think of as a, a, a parent. And um, we've heard a little bit about the language of at risk Parents who maybe um, our children are at risk of being at risk, which might be all parents, as Doug was saying. Uh, also, I think Cassie, I heard her say something about attachment. And I thought that was kind of interesting um, piece to also be thinking about for the customers as parents who are promoting attachment or supporting attachment or um, needing supports for attachment, maybe, I think is maybe what I'm hearing a little bit. Did I miss anything from what you were hearing, Alexander? No, I just do think it'd be worth discussion, and maybe it's not right now, but to think about instead of the word parent, I think that when I think about attachment and I think about parent, I think we know and research shows it takes one adult to, to securely attach with a child to make a huge difference. And so I think as we move forward, I would want, because of that label, for us to have a narrower focus than maybe we should. So I appreciate any additional conversation on, is there a different word that would help us as a committee as we develop ideas so that it's really about that person, that attached person to the child, not necessarily a parent. What do you guys think? Karen, I, think I think that's an interesting thing. It's hard for the one-year-old to be attached to somebody other than the parent. As it grows, as you grow older, then I think there's more opportunities for attachment. So I think we really, when we look at early childhood, we have to look, and especially from birth to two or three years of age, we really have to look at parents and perhaps some of our, our early childhood experiences and, and caregivers. But, but it really falls a lot on parents at those earlier ages that you're going to have an attachment to. It's going to make a difference in that child when they get to be school age. I don't disagree, but I think child care providers can be that attachment. And I think it's important for them to be included on these conversations because there's kids that are spending 40 to 50 hours in a child care center or a family child care home that can be a secure attachment for them. So maybe we just are, we, as we think about when we get to a point where we're communicating with the community at large, maybe we just think about our messaging to make sure that we're addressing both the parent and the child and other people in that child's environment or world that can also be a secure <coughs> attachment. So we, I just, I appreciate that conversation, but to be sensitive to that so that all the people that we hope to reach to feel like they're part of the way we do messaging. So thank you for that. Do we want to talk about how far in that age range we want to go? I know we talked about three, we talked about five. What do we want to focus on? If we had limited amount of funds, limited amount of time, and we wanted to make the greatest impact with your customers. If we're narrowing in on secure attachment, that's really important to start immediately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to expand the children. Not to say that it can't happen later, but it's very important that they have that secure attachment when they are. Doug, what does that sound like when you hear those pieces for the work that you're doing? Yeah, you know, by the time we start working with somebody that's 15 or 16, and 
it's pretty tough. We work with them for six months at the most, but to go back and help them because they haven't had help or supports or <clears throat> discipline, you know, limits, any boundaries, whatever you want to call it, for 16 years, and we try to change them in three months, it ain't going to happen in most cases. Um, unfortunately, with the diversion stuff and truancy, you know, half of them will probably change on their own. It's the other half that you know, need the supports and the interventions, but you know, finding the, the correct stuff is always almost like treasure island hunt. You know, what's going to help them? But if you try to offer as much and have them make the choice and the decisions instead of you know forcing anybody to do anything. I, I can't make anybody do anything, including my dog. Why we want you know, I learned that a long time ago. She has her own attitude. So I'm not going to force anything on her or any of the folks and families that I work with, but I can offer stuff and it's their choice. So I work with an early intervention. I know there's a lot of resources in our community for that. So I, of course, I'm an advocate for it. I'm wondering with the data that we have available, what are some gaps that no one is really addressing? Are we going to focus in on that? or expand on what is working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is some work um, that has been prepared. You want to talk about it? No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> if I could wave my magic wand mm -hmm. and create a day that I could just work on the things I want to do for all the things to have it all in one place, that would be my wish. Um, you guys, along this journey that we put together can really cool pieces. So I think as you're coming into these meetings, I'd like to be able to have all that information for you. So there is a document that we've identified some of those pieces to get us to this point that we can go back um, and look at. So those um, those gaps were identified by ages. So we'll have a zero to five, I think when we went six through So there's some of that work that has it's not um, perfect, but it, it, it's easy to do. So I guess for this group, are we are we addressing the gaps of what we want to focus on, or are we building off of what is already established to make it better for more effective work? I think we're going to, I hope, hold on to that question. So I think at the end today, I want to make sure we get the answer to that question. So you guys think, like, well, I feel like that's going to be determined by this group. Right. So once we kind of get by this customer piece, then we start talking about what are we doing well in the community. And we might choose then to build on what we do well. Or we might choose to build on something we're not doing well. It's going to be about the group. I guess I was thinking of to, to determine who the customer is. Which way do we want to go? And I guess it would be like the same as Lisa and Cindy has there. Is like we were talking a little bit about speaker attachment and preventative care, kind of what what our focus is going to be with that. But and then looking at what that gap might be, you know, we we see that there's a lot of stuff that's done with our daycare center <clears throat> with the Pens program and then the next steps and things like that. We, we see that there's those things that sometimes I look at like our community and granted I haven't been a new mom for over nine years now, but like the care like in the hospital, you know, they, I feel like that's an area of the gap, like being a new mom and don't really talk about anything. You don't really take any classes as a parent. So just like just understanding that I think is kind of an area of gap. Like, kind of start from the beginning, like how to bond with your child, or I don't know, different things like that. Some people know have that great support system and role models and all that, and a lot of people these days don't have that. I mean, just looking at my lens with like foster care lens, I've been on that foster care board and just kind of seeing the trauma and things that go through from gone and so it just seems like that might be an area 
about some of that and about uh, the fact like, and I haven't been a mom, uh, new mom for a lot of, <laughs> lot of years, but I can remember when I left the hospital, I had, there was a certain video that I had to watch about um, <clears throat> CPR and that kind of stuff. I'm wondering if we talk to doctors about giving things in the hospital before you leave about, even if it's a 10 minute little ditty um, for them to watch about bonding and skin to skin contact and how important that is, why it's important. It can be a 10 minute video. Um, but I think that for some people that will impact them for a long time. I guess now I'm in the long 18 months now, so <laughs> a little bit more recently. And now you watch videos on shaking baby, safe sleep, and CPR. That's all you watch before you are allowed to sit with your home. So, <laughs> and you're there. You're there for a long period of time. There's no reason why there can't be more um, regarding that bonding and. You know, you can't leave unless you have a car seat, but you can leave and not know how to feed your child appropriately or how to love on them appropriately. So I, I wonder if we don't start at that, at that beginning. Well, and I know you had talked about the prenatal stuff, um, giving information uh, when you go in because- You're going in every four weeks. Yeah, you have to go in anyway. So many education pieces they could be doing. And I can remember I had a high needs little fart when I would have a kid. And I can remember going in and taking him in for his um, well, check. well checks and that kind of stuff. And I would be all frustrated. You know, I'm a 26 year old social worker that allegedly knows all this stuff. And I was frustrated and felt uncomfortable. I can't imagine um, a younger parent going in and feeling all of that. And I was lucky because she came to me and said, I've got toys in the drawer. You go in my room until um, I come, you know, we come and get you. But a lot of kids and moms in that area had all that frustration and everything, and nobody did anything a little extra for them. So I wonder. Well, there's some that oh, go ahead, go ahead. I love that idea. And I love the idea of even thinking about moving it into an OB's office or, you know, what's a, what's a, a two minute something they can watch while they wait to get into their doctor's appointment, their prenatal appointments. I mean, are there, so I just, I just want to support that idea. I love that idea. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll speak from the point of a physician. We did this for 40 plus years. And it's a very hurried environment. When you go into the doctor's office, you may sit in a waiting room, you may sit in an exam office. That physician and staff are very busy. As a pediatrician, I always felt that I should teach parenting. How much time did I have? Yes. Uh, and I picked three or four things that I thought that were important for parents to hear. But that that reflects back on all of us. Because I, I would question how many of us ever had a parenting class. I'm a pediatrician and never had a parenting class. <laughs> Well, you might have some bias in your <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but as I reflect around the room, this is a real problem in our community because you don't teach parenting in two minutes in the pediatrician's office or two minutes. So you have to have resources in the community and you have to have a willing commitment from parents to learn about parenting. If that's the hardest thing you're going to do in your life, and you have no, no knowledge of how to do it. I mean, you model what your parents, the way your parents parented, and that may have been good or bad. And so, you know, my, my perspective is we've got to figure out how we can teach parenting better. And we have open discussions among parents that are better. It isn't on our schools. It's we've got to get it before they get to school. To me, that first three to five years is if we can teach those kids 
you know, the things we talked about the last time, they're going to be much more successful throughout their whole life. So, I, you know, my, I don't know how to do it, or I would have done it years ago. I know, I think I touched on this last time that um, when my youngest, I have three boys, but my youngest was probably five or six, probably five. I did circle as security, which is all focused on bonding and attachment. Mm -hmm. And I, my first class, I left there and I'm like, oh my gosh, I failed my other children. <laughs> Even though, it's, they, I mean, they teach you that it's not too late. And really, you only need to do it a small percentage of the time to be able to actually make that bond. Um, but I'm like, oh my gosh, I wonder how my children would have been impacted if I would have known that before I ever had them instead of <laughs> several years after they were. I had a question into their photo yeah. bit of my background. So I was a home visitor before and I'm a circle security facilitator and I have children of my own. Um, and going back to the what, what are we going are doing good, I think we need to support those initiatives. And I also think we need to cover gaps. Um, and it's call to action for the whole community because it's just it, it's gonna be you know not just everybody on the same play field. Um, you know, doing support systems. I haven't yet found one parent in my classes that doesn't mean good because they don't know how to. And it's just heartbreaking, um, devastating, because then once they have the tool, they can do it and they can apply them and they can. Um, and I think the, the research is there, the, the programs are there. Um, I think it's the coming into the community and collaborating and everybody being on, knowing what's been offered so everybody, can, so everybody can offer it. Like Alexander and I were having a conversation earlier. When they go to the schools, the schools know what that, they're receiving the same uh, message um, of a secure attachment everywhere, not just at home, not just at school. I mean, there's circular security for classroom as well. Um, they're for parents. And it has to be prenatal. I think everybody in here ha has said something that is so crucial and important to the, you know, the whole initiative. I just want to say. Go ahead. I just want to say, first of all, um, having taught parenting classes myself for like 40 years, um, <clears throat> two high school kids, right? So I was a family to school science teacher and, uh, and child development class and those kind of things. Sometimes, People don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of always kept that in the back of my head and felt that, you know, just try this, see if it works. I also had to teach a class one time. You know, I had the opportunity to teach a class one time. <laughs> I'm talking with the students about alcohol and a part of that program, since it was a grant funded, we had to have a parent group that met. And let me tell you what, when you're talking with those parents about the way they might parent, it is extremely difficult because who am I to tell you how to parent? That's, I mean, that's just kind of the attitude that was there. And so we had to work through that and we did a lot of discussion about that. And so then we found out that, no, that's not what we're trying to do. We're just trying to give you other options. If what you're doing works, great. Keep doing whatever it is you're doing. But if you need another parent, you have ideas off of. So that really made a difference. Of course, that topic was alcohol, you know, so it was a little bit different. But that's just something that I think everybody needs to keep in mind as far as, far as teaching. <clears throat> the other thing is the schools right now, at least, and I don't know who else does, but offers these classes, but there's usually a fee. And I don't know if that's a barrier for some people. I would assume it's a barrier for some people. Or is there a way to pay for that in somewhere in the community? Circle of security. I mean, I would hear about them all because that's the one I hear the most of. Yeah. yeah. We're trying to make a push more towards that circle yeah, security right. versus the yeah. love and logic. Yeah. Um, I know we have facilitated a circle of security parenting class um, with home visitation families, mm -hmm. and we offer it for free. Right. And then the access, we bring that up all the time. When do we usually offer those classes? I'm just throwing this out. You know, if they're offered during the day and I work during the day, how do I go? If it's offered in the evening and I work evening hours, how do I go? I mean, if I'm a parent, you know, so I'm just throwing out thoughts that I've had as people were talking. So 
Um, lots of great, great ideas and lots of great things going on in the community and everybody, but uh, we need to keep those kinds of things in mind too. Circle of Security does have a Nebraska um, website, a Circle of Security org, and um, the people that are facilitating, I facilitate them in Hall County, um, but the people that are facilitating can go on there and put the times for their classes, and when COVID happens, a lot of them are offered um, through Zoom and are free, so that's it's getting better then. Yes, and so you just go, can log in there and you can see, and if it's a Zoom class, um, and a, some communities allow them to be outside of their county to, to participate. Can you guys ask about that? If anybody, anybody has, hasn't had circle security, this is how to explain it. <laughs> and, and I think I really believe in the framework and the beauty of it because you're not teaching then what it's not do. skills it's right. self-reflective and that's the difference it has made in those classes it's an eight week long class they come back every week and reflect on what they see and i think that is the difference between a parenting class of i'm going to tell you what to do and what not to do to i'm going to tell you i'm going to show you this framework and it's up to you and it's really about what parents did to how parents. It's parents the generational parents. focus, which mm -hmm. I like because I was like, it's oh my gosh, that's my start. Like, so from the way I was parented. I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes back to that. You you do what your parents did, good or bad. Um, go ahead. Do you feel like, from a doctor's perspective, if you are encouraging parents to do something like circle security, they be more apt versus hearing it from the community? You know, I think you have to be very diverse. I don't I don't think one program is going to do it because that will appeal to, to him but not to me. So I, I think we have to when we think about this, it's what skills again do we want that three-year-old or five-year-old to have? What are the basic things that we want them to be able to do when they get to school? And how do we teach that? Um, whether it's a parent class or circle of security, you're going to have to have great options because we have about 900 to 1,000 babies in Carney, Nebraska a year. So that's the enormity of the problem. Is I would imagine maybe a half of those are first time mothers, maybe 40%, 50% are first time mothers. So, you know, it's the enormity of the problem is how do we teach parenting and social skills, teach, have parents teach social skills at a young age, and how do we do it to everybody? And I'm just going to build on Dr. Schaefer because you guys are you actually, I don't know if you mentioned we're working on this worksheet here. <laughs> um, and you are getting a ways because I am going to taking notes as you're going and you're, you're in this next box and you're starting to move in there. But I do want to come back to Alexandra's question to make sure we're, we're really identifying the customer first. Um, what I think I hear, and you guys um, let me know if this is what you're hearing, is we are talking about expected parents. Um, we're talking about expected parents, and we may even kind of have an idea of there's about a thousand of them, right, within a year that could be our, our customer. We could even hone in a little bit more. I heard Dr. Schaefer about half of those are first-time parents, right, which we could maybe even go a little deeper. Um, so that possibly could be um, the beginning of your, your customer that you want to start focusing on. Now, I did go into box uh, that first box. How much do you do? I wrote down Circle Security Parenting. Fantastic program. You're hearing the passion around these tables about how important Circle Security Parenting classes are. Um, we talked about physicians. We talked about OBs, uh, offices. We talked about just clinics and hospitals in general and how important education is there. We're doing some of that, right? It's, we're not doing nothing. We are doing something um, in those arenas. Uh, we're talking about school education. There is some education happening even before um, expecting um, children, and we're doing that with teenagers. We also have six pence um, that is working in that space. We also have rooted relationships. This is typically after child has been born. 
there's some fantastic programs also happening there. So we can count the number of programs that we're doing in that space um, for that particular group. So my question back, I'm sorry, I'm going to be leaving to wait for another appointment. Are we focusing on prenatal expected parents, expecting parents? Can I just insert some? Yes, I mean, it kind of addresses that. So I um, didn't have my children in this community. We, I remember specifically a social worker. I think she was a social worker. Um, and of course my memory is, it's, it's been a while, but came in and basically asked me if we had support systems. Do you have family living here? Do you have, what's your experience with taking care of children? I'm from rural Nebraska, I babysat, but they asked all that stuff. And then um, if there was something, a piece missing, they kind of addressed that. Like, how could you fill that gap? Um, I know, I don't know if Hastings still has this, but they had a healthy beginning program. And so if the parents felt that they needed help, they would come in and, you know, make sure that they had diapers, make sure they know how to change diaper. I mean, it could be anything. But, um, and I picked on Hastings um, just because I'm familiar with that program. I don't know if they still do that or not, but it was identified in the hospital. It was in the hospital or home visitation? In the hospital, they asked you, um, you know, what, what your resources are, what your support systems are and that kind of thing, and then identified it. Um, and then I just know from a, another position I had working in Hastings, they kind of followed up with that piece. So sometimes those parents in the community would have a like a referral, um, but you could also self-referral. So if it's like I'm feeling stressed or mom has a mental health issue or whatever, they would come in and actually be with the parents side by side by them and also find resources in the community. Um, most of us sitting around the table here know the resources in our communities, but, you know, if I was 20 and pregnant and had to do it again, you know, I, if I didn't work in human services, I don't think I'd know what was out there. So, so it was nice to have that identified and those questions asked in the hospital. Is anything like that currently happening? Is can I add a few things sure. about from the insurance perspective? Um, so I work for one of Nebraska's Medicaid plans, and um, we do a lot with our members, uh, typically low income or have a child with special needs, um, to identify previous high-risk pregnancies so that they get some kind of care management if they were to become pregnant again, because the likelihood of them having another high-risk pregnancy is there. Um, but we also try to incentivize people to even go to their prenatal appointments, which we don't always see um, uh, that happening. And that can be for many reasons, whether they're putting their own fires out or they can't get the time off of work. But if there are community supports in place with employers to make sure that pregnant moms can get to those doctor's appointments um, and, and have that time paid, or at least it's not being their absence rate or something. Um, I would consider that. Um, and then on the back side of that, uh, you know, mom typically gets one postpartum appointment to check on her physical well being. If there is an option there for a screening for, hey, do you need help with parenting or do you need help with diapers or whatever, that might be an option to ask mom some of those questions at that specific checkup. Um, but after that, it moves into well child appointments. So every time mom goes in, it's with baby to check on baby, and we're not really asking mom or dad anymore how they're adjusting to life as a parent or new parent. So that's all I wanted to add to the conversation. I think that's definitely one to add into the how much do we do the MC the managed care organizations. I think would be a great addition because they do a lot of work in that area as well. And since our care managers are trying to feel out what resources are available in communities, so we can point um, our new parents and kiddos on the plan to see what's existing in the community. Can I ask, um, do we, because we know that moms, uh, that, that people who have given birth lose gray matter in their brain during pregnancy after they've given birth. Do we do a check on their mental health that does physical? Do we ask them about that too? The I didn't have a doctor shaper. I don't know. Pediatricians actually, believe it or not, do for depression check. For uh, postnatal depression, they ask. Um, I know for the first six months, a lot of people are doing it for a year. 
Um, and specifically address the numbers. Ours did it for a year, and every time we went in for a well trial, I had to fill out a paper that said um, it was like a check in to see my mental health, how I was doing. And I can speak on the behalf of the mothers that I work with, high risk teen parents. There needs to be a relationship built. Conversation and relationship. Because they're not, they will not open up. They do ask us questions at the doctor, but they will not open up if they don't feel safe, comfortable. They, they will not open up. So, I mean, relationships were made through home visiting because I visit them three, four times a month on a regular basis. But they, they are asking if they need somebody that can trust and really open up even after and you moved this into the next box how well do you do this um, once you just gave us a great suggestion in that so I'm i just want to keep that process piece going so you're kind of thinking um in this realm of boxes you are moving along in the process that we wanted to to have the conversation today um i am going to keep coming back to the question to make sure you're you're landing in the customer space that you want to be in so i'll open it back up for conversation is there funding that comes with this room like to pay for it that's a great question yeah we're going to learn as we go how's that because until we know what we're working on it's hard for me to say yes you have funding how's that i'm just thinking like you see like everything here is dictated by insurance and what your insurance will cover, but there's no dictation here. How's that? Not, not yeah. the freedom like like for in Europe, <laughs> like Europe and those other places, like we're, if we're talking about secure attachments and, and preventative care, so we're not seeing children or teenagers or whoever entering the judicial system or you know, the being involved with um, criminal crimes or whatever it is, whatever the focus is to help prevent that. Um, like in Europe and places like that, when a child is born, they go home, you are a nurse that comes and checks on you like weekly. They have it's just just that's just part of care. That nurse comes in and every child is born and they they're providing you with whatever. If you're having trouble feeding your child, then they're teaching you how to do that or whatever the needs are. And I forget if it's six months to a year, but I mean in those European countries. That's just common. That's just common uh, postnatal care for families. So, and we you wouldn't be great if we could do that here. And we don't have any of that currently happening, right? No home visitation. We've no. been we've been piecemeal programs that are there for temporary uh, eighteen months, two years, <clears throat> and then the funding falls apart and they don't touch it. So do we have any data right. on any of that were effective? No, never saw any data. I will say a lot of people don't know this about early head start our early head start program starts at prenatal we serve pregnant moms and because we operate through the community action partnership we have access to providing what we can help with we have our ride program so we can help moms and families with transportation we have our food bank program so we can help with food insecurity um and we then if they are qualified in at the prenatal level, they qualify all the way up through five years of age, transitioning from early to start on Head Start. So we can cover from prenatal all the way up to five years. I guess the only limitation we have in Head Start is income base. So it's specifically for low income families. I love a lot of programs to make sure they actually been really thinking, have we ever studied how effective Head Start is in older years. I, I just it just occurred to me here yeah. you're thinking, how do, how do we know we've done that well? It's, it's a, a great program. program. I'm I mean, sure they yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I know there's lots sure. of research out there, like if kids do two years of preschool, they do much better on later on. And like, I know there's lots of research that supports that. Head probably start bleed into some of that, that, though. I bet there's good data. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. I mean, every day you're in that classroom, you're documenting on stuff. Yeah, so sure I'm sure. There is. And we do, there's a lot of documentation all the way from. We do ASQs where we're continually documenting their mental health all the way from early head start. We have 
mental health professionals that we contract that come into the classrooms and they're working with them. We document that. We document everything to do with the families that are. We have specific people that work at each center, um, family service assistants, and they are specifically hired to be working with the families and then documenting the kind of stuff like things, figuring out their needs and how well that's helping. Do you want to ask the question in a way that it was? Threatening, or that I am like imposing that you're not doing good work. You are doing good work. Let me hear me say that you are doing fantastic work at Head Start. Where my mind went was, we don't screen at Diversion to see how many of those kids are coming into the Diversion that are in Head Start. Yeah, that, that's where my mind went. It's like, oh, how do we know that the children in Head Start are not the children we're still working with down the road? That's just where my head went, and I don't know that we have local data. I have no doubt we've got great statewide national data there, but it gets to this bottom box. How do we know anyone's better off from the, the thing pieces that we're doing? Thanks for some visiting, and I can speak off of that. In, in the state, they, they're, they're, um, they're very, they're working with the university to cut track that data because it's been a big transition for three years. We do special assessments, we do assessments every six months about how the child is doing, the parent interaction with the child. Um, how far do you follow them? Um, so right now, the, they go up to three years and then um, I believe they're, they're using their goals because they work with the, the um, goals in, in the school system to track them. So they start at prenatal, when they start with the, the best way that they're tracking them. Um, do you know so how old some of those that have gone through it are? K through 12, or they, since they started, it's hard because every every city has a different initiation fee. Um, so we I don't know what, what has. For initiation? Six. Six. See where I'm going with these questions? How do we know these efforts that we're doing at these levels are really making the impact? I know CCP has been in Carney, CCP, which is the child, the six inch child care partnership. We're going on seven years. I have a the home visitation, I'm not 100% sure how so long. So we don't know if we can track those kiddos after age three. I think they're academically, they're, they're tracking them. Academically, they're tracking them. Those okay. that go into, like, Kearney, if they go into Kearney Public Schools, preschool uses goals. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the elementary uses goals. Mm -hmm. But if they are, then that data is being gathered as long as they stay in our community. And it's all of them. It follows them if, it, if it, they have a, a universal number with yes. giving goals, and it follows them wherever they go. They're they're given but they're given their state. student number basically the second they're in a six tenths child care partnership program. They're in our KPS system home visitation. They're in our KPS system. So yeah, we I mean we can follow them as long as they stay within our school district. And is this for only low income or all? Um. Mostly at risk, so low income, Spanish speaking, um, low birth weight. But parents, everybody needs it. <laughs> parents, right. parents, parents, parents that haven't graduated. Right, five, because five, there's five. a lot of other kids that have issues that don't just come from low income families. Right. Yeah. You know, there's yeah, a lot of two parent households. Yes. There's just. You we actually were talking about that. that. With every single early childhood program in the city of Kearney. No. Wow. I mean, think about that. Income. No, I, mean, I was just saying, like, any in home daycare could be a really make a difference. How, how honest is that? Like, whoa. How would you figure that out? Because you have, there's a lot of in home daycare centers that are really making a difference, but we can't document that. There's a lot of commercial, so to speak, for a child care centers that are wonderful. But I don't know how they track them to go. <clears throat> I don't think we have any kind of a system of the same way. To There's a step up to qualities and they, it's a rating system. Um, right, but not everybody does that. No. And yeah, you can't track the children that way. 
Yeah, it's just a step up. No. I don't think I'm there's research that. though that yes, quality child care. There is a connection between quality child care and instruction as a child being successful, but you're not actually successful. How do you define your customer? Wow. <laughs> I'm going to come back to that question. Then. How do you define your customer? Can you do like prenatal and three or prenatal and five? Or are you just saying prenatal or? You can ask the group. I don't want to make that decision. I, I would encourage. I would encourage us to definitely <laughs> consider prenatal to age five for this for all the topics we've discussed. I would also encourage us to consider maybe five to eleven or twelve ish. You know, Doug was mentioning eleven and up is his population age. But I work with elementary students, finding them a successful mentor. So this goes right in align with caregivers, important people. So I feel like my work could benefit that elementary kindergarten through fifth graders. And then, you know, if you want to explore it older, but I like that we're focusing on prenatal because that is truly where it starts. But elementary age is where mentoring can come, come into place as well. I struggle with cutting it off at five for the prenatal to five because early childhood is the age eight. And I just my personal life. It's not five. Eight. It's like bringing in a lot of talk for four years. And we just went to a training on Dr. Deb Development, and she talked about the important, the most important, you know, is prenatal to five. Those are three, those three to five. But then she also stressed the importance of this, um, that preteen years of, of brain growth and, and needs at age, you know, seven, eight to 12 how important that is because those are the two most important parts in our human life of brain growth and development they talk about the windows of opportunity yeah to go back to uh, so you know looking at brain research you know we have the, the opportunity of prenatal and then we have another opportunity when they're pre-adolescent I feel like as a parent of two boys, the parenting totally changed in sixth grade. Uh, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> it's, it's so hard. Yes. Everything that worked no longer worked, and now they are like bigger than me. And so I'm like, yeah. well, we have to agree on stuff because I can't force you into playing out. Right? Right? <laughs> I felt like that too. We were talking about the prenatal like my professional hats like yes but for a dad but as a parent I, I still don't know what I'm doing I'm six to 16 year olds and there's still a lot of what am I supposed to do and but I think I like the elementary age I have a third grader eight year old that was in kindergarten in during COVID mm -hmm. and I feel like he has a whole different childhood and like two years later we're still all my kids were in school during COVID, but I just feel like that elementary age and, and not ever knowing normal in that sense, like there's just a huge revert and gap there. And I feel lost a lot of times. With there is a like, huge gap from what we've been uncovering in these conversations mm -hmm. in that age group of supports. Mm -hmm. We've got programs, we've got versions. Um, that's yeah. why, I mean, we've got to keep programs. So when you look around this room and how many of you are bringing your hats of early childhood to do that for adolescents, those numbers are not the same. Mm -hmm. I will, I'll throw that out there. Do we have to settle on one age group? Can we have primary, secondary, tertiary. And my concern is that I think we have a lot of programs. We obviously are not, with programs that we have, we're not able to reach everyone because most of them are for income-based um, or at risk. And my concern is that I also want to make sure that we're talking about how do we change this culture in the community, right? Because even if we're saying like, before you have a baby, you need to have a parenting class, there's a bad stigma about parenting class, honestly. You need to go to parenting class. 
that's this is, you're not a good parent you, you know and i just think that is generally the idea and so i also think that mm -hmm. no matter what we do we have to figure out a way to really change the conversation in our community we have to bring everybody into it talking about trusted adults and because it's not just the parents, it's all of us that have to support that and to make parenting classes supported and normalized. And that's just something that we do now. So to tag on that, the sixth grade, everything changes in sixth grade. We don't even have collective knowledge of what it's like to be 14 right now. Because being 14 now is not 14 when we're 14. <laughs> right, yeah. so, so I, I just see a gap there. I'm not saying this committee needs to focus on that. I get what you guys are saying. I, I define at risk different. I think just in the space that I work, Kramer works with half the kids I work with, and then the other kids are really at risk, but they don't come from any at risk backgrounds. You know, they're they're in that spot where mom and dad are great. They're like mom and dad, but now they need to relate differently to the world, and mom and dad have no ability to guide them through one of the things talking to the Buffalo County uh, Attorney's Office yesterday, and, and we're just talking about uh, naked pictures, call them whatever you want, right? How do you, how do you parents get through that? We had to develop film if we were to take an Audi picture. <laughs> you know, it's a different kind of thing. So they just think different. And what resources are there to help somebody understand how do you parent in that space where you really don't have institutional knowledge, you don't have historical knowledge. There's no way to look back and say, I did what my parents did because that world has changed so dramatically. Not everything. I mean, if you're food insecure, if you're from you know certain backgrounds, of course that creates that risk. I don't deny that at all. But there's other things too. So that's a gap. I don't know for the three of you guys. No, I, I was we were waiting for you to, to step into that space. I, I I'm surprised you haven't said something. Well, I was trying to be respectful. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with both of them, and I also think there's a lot overall lack of support for parenting, and that starts in the prenatal. Like, I love that getting these parents time off to go to their prenatal appointments, to go to their child's well being appointments, to maybe go to their a mental health appointment after having a baby. Mm -hmm. Having a 14 year old and needing time off for whatever appointment, or maybe just to spend time with them. There is a lack of understanding or a lack of support for parents in general. That is all stigmatized and isn't like you were saying, it's got to be a conversation. We have to figure out how you have a conversation where people can get together and say, My kid's not the crazy one. You all kids are all crazy. That's that just alone so would be helpful. Sorry. But even even employers mm -hmm. like understanding that it has, hey, it has to be the social norm in the community mm -hmm. that yes. we want to do this. I want to be a good parent, and where can I go to learn to be a good parent? Right now, we're struggling. If, if you're not if you're not of low income and you're not disadvantaged, where do I go? Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. When I first moved to Kearney, I had children that were entering preschool, and I could not find them a preschool, and I was so upset about it because income base, I didn't qualify for Head Start, but all the private ones all had spots filled. And I'm like, what? And I absolutely value education. So I almost was having a meltdown myself because I couldn't get my kid into preschool. And thank the Lord it all worked out. But yes, that I mean, there is a gap there also. And, and just because I make a certain amount doesn't mean I'm more equipped than anybody else that my parents for. I do have a question though. So what is the line between, because I obviously, but by no means am I disagreeing that we have a gap. I think we have quite a few gaps. But also, what is the line between we have a gap that we need to fill and there's just a lack of education on it? Like, I can't remember what it yeah, is. Like, Kathy, people Kathy, don't Kathy, know the resources she, there. So they saying? don't know what they don't know. Um, there's a lot of things that, even before I started coming to the collab, I didn't know that was in our community. And it's just a matter of, actually educating on what is available. Like, I didn't know that the circle of security classes were free. And I worked for HHS before I worked for Head Start and I didn't know that. I, where, where's the line of we have gaps and we just need to be educated more. 
I know we've talked for years about the it's not relevant until drill in. So we can put together all kinds of we used to have a phone book or whatever thing. Because our Thursday meeting that we all have, we try to keep that up to date yes. yeah. and talk to Sarah Perez. She will get you all the resources. Can we rename your group the Yellow Book? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> community connections. We had it first. We're community connections slash Yellow Book. See, Cassie. Yes, sorry. You brought that up. <laughs> Where were you going? Well, well, it's like in suicide prevention or in. You can put it out there that it's available for a parent to talk, but until it matters to them, it doesn't matter doesn't to them. And we found that for years that um, a parent will have no idea what we do, and most of you probably have no idea, until all of a sudden it becomes relevant. And then it's, oh, yeah, we've been doing this for 20 some years. But when your kiddo is five, what do you care what people are doing with 17 and 18 year olds? It's just not relevant to you until it is relevant. And I think that's where a lot of the gaps are. There's tons of, I never knew what we were doing until I got involved with Buffalo County Community Partners and my head just blew up about all the resources around here and everything that's going on. But how do you communicate? How do you change the conversation to say, we all want to be good parents. It's not, I'm not a bad parent if I go to a class. I mean, it's it's all that stuff. We need a marketing person who's willing to market this out and give us a campaign. Well, I just thought somebody <laughs> said it earlier, like, when I was a new mom, I mean, there's, I mean, we've all been to the doctor's office. No offense, Dr. Schaefer, but we sit for a while, right? Uh -huh. And if somebody would have handed me a pamphlet on circle of security, I would have read it because I'm sitting there doing nothing else, frankly. And I probably would have did that class. I mean, but I didn't know about it until my children were later on. There's you know? so many. <laughs> Which is yeah. You know, I say, well, I did, I have a cell phone then. Like, <laughs> <children aren't laughs> <going. laughs> but you are going to resources. Yeah, you can read while you're sitting in the waiting room. Yeah, there's some amazing videos out there. I know mean, right? it's small, but it could be impactful. I mean, very impactful. Like very, there's a lot of very short videos by Harvard University by all these. We, I mean, I think the research is there, and they have put it well together to. You know, make that impact. Yeah. Waiting rooms yeah. need more of this yeah. in there. Because I have no doubt. I mean, the doctors, they're, they're busy, like, and I get yeah. that. But if and I'm I waiting, waiting in there, <laughs> <laughs> step in again into this amazing conversation. I love it. Um, I am going to come back to Cassie. Cassie, I do believe this group, and totally giving permission, whether I have the ability to give permission or not, to give this group permission that you are the education, right? You're learning so much from each other, and you're inviting more people to come to this table because we're all learning together. And I think that's what Jason has had blows up with. You know, there's so much out there. I think this is where you start gathering resources and people and say, this is where you need to come to learn how to get connected with the resources that people are looking for. I'm coming back to your customers. I heard two things now, and um, I'm hearing this birth two, three, five, eight. Oh, I'm okay with that. I also, I probably still hear a little bit more birth to three because it's kind of that, am I using the right tech, uh, term blooming and pruning of the brain because the brain is blooming a lot. I just did a rotary presentation uh, Monday, had to call Alexandra and said, tell me what this means. Um, our human brains right now, every minute uh, are having a trillion synopsis. Anybody want to guess what a baby that's been born Synopsis is a lot. Why is that? Yeah. Or more. Or more. Yes. So the ability for us to help support parents and um, developing brains in that zero to three is exponential. Now the other thing I do not think our community knows outside of this room, maybe a few, is you have the same opportunity at pre-adolescence. Mm -hmm. And I think as a community, we give up on that age group because they're difficult. They're hard to communicate with. Even as a parent, you're just like, oh my gosh, grow up, go to 21 or 25, and then we can have a conversation again, right? I mean, <laughs> it's a hard age, but I don't know the community knows how much opportunity you have to help with brain development at that age. So I'm hearing those two consumer areas. Am I right? Can you clarify for me if you mean the actual zero to three? For the parent of that first parent. 
parents of that. I'm saying with so adolescent, you're talking to your parents. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't. My vote is for prenatal. 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 Yeah. So I don't, I don't okay. know, Denise, why we can't do both. What we could have two work could, groups. Yeah, the board member I would say I would, the steering committee, I would support two work groups if there's interest in that. Okay. I'd like to give us a primary and um, raise your hand if you want two groups. <laughs> It doesn't even need to. I think no, there's no. a difference between yeah. prenatal and like that free that we're going to let our focus in and then work that over age children okay. because it looks way different the material and education, all that kind of stuff. And it has to be connected because you're also so, talking about some of the same parents. Yeah. So, yeah. I, you know, I would have no qualms if we broke out in groups. Yeah. Can we have it? If we have another meeting. I mean, that's an option. <laughs> Here's the birth to X age. <laughs> <laughs> here's here's pre-adolescent group. We can not even define that by age because I think some kids it starts to stay on. Some kids are going to start until they're 50 or so. Um, so I mean, I would have no qualms with doing that and offering that up to the group. Is an offer on the table. Remember, I'm not a decision maker. This is your group. But I also like what um, Nikki. Nikki said. I'm like, what are we drawing for? What do you mean? What Nikki said as well. I mean, we have our two groups, but we got to be able to, because it's a lifespan. We got to tie it back together and, and keep all those, the same parent in each group engaged um, as well. I'm thinking about programs that I know of that are are evidence based and and they can be applied to Social Security Shine like that can be applied. It's just the wording of to adolescents. You mean? Yeah, like it can be applied to infants. I mean, it's just. I think even in this room, though, you can see the discrepancy between the two groups would be wide because you'd have. 40 people that are all early childhood and then like three of us that have any resources for pre-adolescents. I don't know that that necessarily would be helpful for the pre-adolescent group to you know, have such reduced capacity for conversation and ideas and brainstorming. Um, I think you'll have people come out and break into groups that you wouldn't normally get here. Don't if it's not silo, if there's short. an opportunity for... We can answer some of those questions as we go. Um, I do want to leave you with some homework, and then we have a couple other questions that I want to um, want to come back to. I'll type up all my quick scratches here, so you have something to think about. And I will attempt to to define the customer as I I heard you um, share it today. I do want you to be thinking about what's currently happening in the community. How much are we doing? And the age groups are that zero, I'll say zero to eight, and pre adolescents, since we haven't really defined that. And then how well do we do it? So, of those programs, how well have we done it in our community? And who's doing it really well, right? And then keep challenging yourself to say, is anybody better off? So, how are we preventing those youth that we are going to start talking about as parents? Support the parents so we're preventing youth entering that system. How do we know that Head Start is preventing kids from going to seek out youth? How do we know that when you go to a circle security parenting class that you're not ending up with Doug? Doug seems to be like the problem. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Especially if it's not on this with Doug, and then you see the county you turning face to face, and that's a whole other <laughs> environment, like Jason was saying. Um, I keep thinking about that. It's that prevention to make sure that um, what we're doing is effective. And I do think that's what you're wanting to accomplish is preventing kids from ever needing to step into a system that's governed for them where they don't have choices. Um, there's still a lot of conversation at the steering committee level of systems. Um, we're still trying to kind of work through some of that, but uh, we do want to bring that to you to help us define some of that language because it, it really really good conversations about that but that is down the road anyway said so i will type this up your homework is anyone better off who's doing that well and what what is that what does that person look like that's um the recipient of our supports so that's your homework i'm going to type this up it's going to come out to you 
the leadership team is going to regroup and kind of figure out the process for the next conversation. Am I right, Nicole? Yep. Another challenge for your homework. And I, I want you to be just vulnerable for a minute because I it's going to come out kind of it may come out blaming, and I don't intend to come out blaming. We have said around these tables, parents need to, parents need to, parents need to. There is not a single parent in this room that we've asked what they need. Where are they? Who's connecting with them? And how do we get them to this table to start balancing that a little bit? Because we're not here to create another parent program to tell parents what to do. We are here to figure out what parents need and support that. So try to turn that hat, no blame. I, it just comes out clumpy because I'm still trying to figure out the language to best say that. The parents need to be a part of the solution mm -hmm. and parents need to co-design the work that we do. And how do we get more parents around this table? Um, that also is part of your homework. I know part of homework, but has an invitation been extended to parents to come to this. I mean, I only hear of it just because I see the email one day. If they're not on our email list, no. I will take that blame. Because yeah, I don't parents, know that we have parents. Likewise, there's a lot of parents around the table. There are parents around the table. I mean, I can send you, like, our elementary school will have a list or the parents we can cite as part of it. But, I mean, can you get, like, information from daycares? Yes, they're, they're around the table here too. I think we just need to think about how do we bring parents into this conversation without them being the token parent. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, hey, here's our parent who's going to speak on behalf of all parents, <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 So I do kind of, I, I ask you to go back to your program saying who is a parent who um, would be comfortable coming to this meeting or learning more about this meeting and would I be able to bring them along with me to this? Um, so they're co-designing, they're coming along with you um, and they see the meaning of the work because they understand it, they know it. And you do have collective parenting skills around this. So I'm empty nesting, so I have no parenting skills. I'm done parenting that. <laughs> that goes back to, I mean, this is during the work day. Yes, I, this is another time off for us. Normal working parent is probably going to say no. We do have money to pay them, so we can pay a stipend to them for attending. So if the parent um, has financial concerns about that time off, we can pay. I wonder if our collective parents that they bring, though, they should look at the different levels of where they're at. Like, I mean, we a lot of Younger our parents are around a lower social economical, I don't know what the word, economic um, status. You know, all of our services kind of seem to be served those low income families. So I wonder if we're inviting them, are we going to bring more people that are in our same class level rather than having a well diverse committee of what are your parenting needs and different social economic demographics? Because I just feel like that matters with parenting and services and, and how children view the world. And, or entering systems, you know. Yeah, it's your homework. I want you to think about it. Who would you bring along with you? I feel like if we invite just a wide range, we need to think about how we present information too. Because if we get into ABC Doc and yeah. Lingo, we're going to lose them like that. Right. So we have to be more of a, I don't know, almost led by, let them kind of plan the agenda. And, we, we really have a think through with that yeah. agenda <laughs> that we're not. Yeah. yeah. Well, that could be one of your strategies. You're inviting parents from listeners and say, we're just here to listen. Yeah. And we want the parents to come and have close to conversation. One of your strategies. All right, that's your homework. Uh, thinking about how we know children are going to be better off from our emphasis on those customers. Think about how parents get engaged in co design this work with you. Anything else to pull? No. Um, I'm thinking for the next group, we actually split you up into groups. My fear is that you'll have three people in the adolescence group and 50 in the other. Well, I'm just wondering, like, 
are we have we came to a consensus? I guess are we, are we going to try and hit both of these populations, or do we, do we want to focus on one? I guess like if we're going prenatal to eight, and then the pre adolescent could possibly start at ten. I mean, there's only a couple of year. How would we really clearly identify, or how do you blend it? They have to work together. I think Nikki was saying that too. We just need to make sure what we're doing in the younger ages is going to carry over into the adolescent. Yeah. Like, how would I be at both movies if I'm not seeing both sides? Yeah. I think maybe we can skip one group for now and then grow to see where it goes. I, I mean, you could do you could already have crossover and like COSP says it's never too late. So a, a parent of a 14 year old could go to COSP. Learn something from that and take something from that. Well, I was just saying you could just make it separate meetings. So like, you know, say for the purpose of this meeting on this particular due date, this So we could start with um, early childhood yeah. and make sure that the end of the unit is also talked about adolescence, how that carries on into the next. So we're retaining a parent with us to talk about everything, or we have like a whole separate different meeting in time for this parent. Can we, can we talk about that uh, a little more before we make the decision? Mm -hmm. How to get how to get from parents parent, to yeah. yeah. Yeah, we were just talking, Jamie LeGates, um, we would love for her to be a part of that conversation I think that as well. really probably needs to happen. I think we need to figure out how we can do that in this committee. Maybe we need somebody to do a little research when we start asking about uh, what does, um, you know, a certain program that we talked about, what are their outcomes? Uh, if it's in the literature, maybe we need to have somebody do a literature search for us and bring that back. So if the staff could help with that. Uh, I think some of that would be beneficial to answer some of those questions. <coughs> maybe the steering committee can take that off this committee's shoulders and uh, see what we can do to help. All right, in wrapping up, I hear, I really kind of hear a zero to adolescence age groups that you're interested in working with, uh, parents of those ages. Prenatal, so I keep saying zero. Yeah. <laughs> <Take> me <laughs> <in. laughs> Moving from child or daycare to child care has taken me several years, so I, I'll keep working on prenatal to end of adolescence, whatever that might be. I'm going to type this up so that you have this to reflect on. You're going to be thinking about um, what we're doing in the community for those age groups, how well we're doing it, and is anyone better off? We're going to take a couple of people's pieces back to the steering committee. Um, the Dr. Schaefer just talked about, and we're going to talk at the next meeting about how to engage parents in this conversation to co design the whole design of having parents. So, we'll see you soon. And think with that group, just making sure that's also a piece that we mm -hmm. keep at the forefront. I would also say that the disability community is invited and considered whether, whether it's location, access to the building, the room. You know, the closed captioning are awesome. Um, making sure that that community knows they're invited to participate. We had wanted to ask you where, what you wanted to do with the other four areas that you're not just prioritized. Um, I don't think we have time to really have that conversation, but do you know that that's going to be a question coming up? Does it need to be discussed where else that information lives? We don't want it just to be set aside and not to come back to that. So that's probably another question for you to consider. Our next meeting will be here.
on October 26th. Thank you. Oh, looks like I was Thank you for those on Zoom.